comes out, having made atonement for himself, his household and the whole community of Israel. Well, church, this morning, as uh, Frankie mentioned, uh, we do come to a passage uh, in the book of Leviticus that is uh, the most uh, important set of instructions uh, that we have within the book, within this book of Leviticus. Uh, And this chapter of Leviticus is uh, is so important um, that it's not only the central set of teaching for the book of Leviticus that we're studying this term, this chapter is actually the, the central set of teaching for the entire five books, the first five books of the Old Testament, which, which we, the Jews call the Torah. Uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, they make up the bulk of God's laws to His people Israel. Uh, these are the five books that were authored by the prophet Moses and the chapter that Uh, Hannah just read out to us now, is a central set of instructions of that entire book, set of books. So it's really, really important. It's good that we're spending a day looking at it today. And for us to have a grasp of how important it is, I want to turn your attention to something that we've looked at a couple of times already, but it's something that we can't look at enough to remind ourselves of how important this, this, this is. And so if I could get you guys to turn back to uh, page 84, if you've got your church Bibles, but I want to look at the first, sorry, the last few verses of the book of Exodus, and then after we do this, we'll look at the first couple of verses of the book of Numbers, so that we can see the role that the book of Leviticus plays within God's purposes for His people. So we'll go to Exodus chapter 40, which is the book right before Leviticus, and we'll read verses 34 and 35. Exodus 40, we'll read verse 34 and 35. So the context here, God has given Moses a set of instructions so they can build this makeshift temple that uh, they're using as they travel to the promised land. And after it's all been put up, This is what we read in in verse 34 and 35. We're told, Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. That's the makeshift tent. Verse 35, Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Now, the, the, the point here is kind of a little bit of an anticlimax to the book of Exodus. It's like, God is going to live among you. So, they build this makeshift temple. And then God's Spirit comes in this makeshift temple. And you're told at the end of the book, but Moses couldn't come in. It's like, God lives among you, but you can't come in. Now, if you can, turn with me to the first verse of the book of Numbers, which is the book after the book of Leviticus. If you've got your church Bible with you, it's on page 111. And we'll just read Numbers chapter 1, verse 1. We're told there, The Lord spoke to Moses in the tent of meeting in the desert of Sinai on the first day of the second month of the second year after the Israelites came out of Egypt. Do you notice the significance there? God, the Lord, spoke to Moses where? In or out of the tent of meeting? In. So what happened between Exodus and Numbers? The book of Leviticus. What allowed Moses to go in to where God was? The book of Leviticus. And the high point of the book of Leviticus is chapter 16, 
which was the Day of Atonement, where God provided a way for the sin of His people to be atoned, dealt with, so that they could relate to God and be in His presence. And the book of Leviticus as a whole is structured in a way to help us to see the importance of this day. It's a marvelous, it's a mind-blowing way that the, the biblical authors would structure their writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to draw our attention to what is most important. And so if we can have the next slide up now, this is uh, an outline of the book of Leviticus to show us how it was ordered. If we can go to the next slide, you'll notice the book begins and ends with what we call pr holy practices. It begins with a set of sacrifices that they had to keep up and it ends with a set of festivals that they had to uh, obey. These holy practices were there so that the nation would have, within the life of the community, things that always reminded them of God's holiness. And then if we can go to the next slide, from there, there that's, that those holy practices are bracketed then by rules for the priest. The reason why the rules for the priests are there is because the priests are the ones who are leading the people to see the importance of those practices. If we can go to the next slide... What's bracketing that section are the rules for the people, which are indicating that the holy practices are there to be led by the priests who are themselves concerned about the conduct of God's people. And then the next slide shows us the heartbeat of the book, which is the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement is what purifies the people, the priesthood, and gives them an opportunity to be holy and to practice their holiness in light of the community. It's, it's a central part of the book. It's central to God's purposes for His people. The Jews had seven feasts that they celebrated throughout the year. The, the Day of Atonement was the most important one, the most sacred day of the year more sacred than the Passover. And it was, they were commanded to keep this festival until the coming of the Messiah. Because on this day, God made atonement for the people's sin. And it's the, the central part of the book because that was the greatest need for God's people. And it reminds us that it's also our greatest need as well. Now, we all come in here with problems, don't we? Everyone's got problems. Some people are sick. Some people's problems are emotional. Others, physical. Some, relational. Some of you, your marriages might be on the rocks. Others of you have, I know, cancer is in your body. You're facing death. Others have loved ones in hospital, in palliative care. We've, everyone's got issues. Let us see from God's Word this morning that whatever problems you have brought in here this morning, your greatest problem in life is your sin. And this is the problem that God has chosen to deal with here on this Day of Atonement. Now, what is atonement? Atonement, by definition, is a payment that is made to repay a wrongdoing, so that the offender and the one offended can be reconciled together. Right? Atonement is a payment that is made to repay a wrongdoing so that the offender and the one offended can be reconciled together. That's what atonement means. Now, on a human level, you imagine I take my car and I smash your car and it's completely my fault. For me to atone for that mistake would be to fix your car for you and maybe to pay you something to compensate for the trouble, the inconvenience that it might have caused you. The reason that I try to make atonement for my mistake ultimately is because I want to reconcile the relationship. 
But because I've done something wrong, atonement can't be made unless there's a payment made and the relationship is restored. That's the whole point of atonement. Now, as atonement relates to us and God, which is the context of this passage, atonement is the price we pay for our sin to satisfy the justice of God so that sinful humans can be reconciled with a holy God. That's what atonement is all about. Which is a problem because God said that the wages of sin is death. The soul who sins should die. And so nothing less than death can satisfy the perfect justice of a holy God who has been sinned against by His creatures. And as I've said before, because God is the author of life, He must be obeyed. And if we choose to disobey His Word, we forfeit our right to live. That's the authority of God. And it's a problem because there's nothing we can do to pay God off. He has no need that we can fill. Our sorry doesn't cut it. We need God to provide atonement for us. If God did not choose to provide atonement for us, there would be no payment that we could make to restore the relationship that we had broken because of our sin. In church, the good news of the Day of Atonement is that on this day, God showed His people what He had given them to pay the penalty for their sin so that they could be reconciled to Him. And the people of God say, Oh, thank God. And church, if we want to understand the Bible as a whole, or if we even want to understand the work of our Lord Jesus, we have to understand this theme of atonement. And glory to God, this is what this chapter is all about. Now, so we can all be on the same page as we talk about some strange things in our ears. Could we have the next couple of slides up? Firstly, see this. There's a courtyard there, and then the tabernacle, it's, uh, the, the, there's a tent of meeting. So the, the tabernacle is like the whole space. Where that arrow is, is, is where the sacrifices were burned. So when you hear about a sacrifice being burned, it's, it's happening there. It's in, a, it's in a holy place because it's within the tabernacle. It's within what is known as the courtyard. If we can go to the next slide. You see that temple there is made up of two rooms. The arrow is pointing to the outer room. That was called the holy place. That's where the priests would go in to minister before God on behalf of the people. But what you're going to hear about today, if we can go to the next slide, is a priest, the high priest, only the high priest, going into this space. This space was called the most holy place, and only one man who was the high priest was allowed to go into this space and only once a year. And can you guess on what day he was allowed to go in there? On the Day of Atonement. This is why it's such a big deal. Now, if we can turn back to Leviticus 16, uh, we'll get into this passage and work out what it is all about. So Leviticus 16, in your church Bible, if you have one, it's on page 99. And we'll make a start to this by reading uh, verses 1 through to the start of verse 3. Leviticus chapter 16, from verse 1 to the start of verse 3. The Lord spoke to Moses, after the death of the two sons of Aaron who died when they approached the Lord. 
the Lord said to Moses, tell your brother Aaron that he, by the way, Aaron's the high priest, that he is not to come whenever he chooses into the most holy place behind the curtain in front of the atonement cover on the ark, or else he will die. For, or because, I will appear in the cloud over the atonement cover. And then at the start of verse 3, this is how Aaron is to enter the most holy place. And then we have the rest of Leviticus 16. You see what it's about? Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, they approached God in a way that wasn't right, not according to His Word. They were both consumed with fire on the spot. And then so God gives them a set of instructions and says, this is how you come into my presence. This is how you come into the most holy place. And notice, the Day of Atonement was God's way to show the high priest how he can approach a holy God. And I hope we can see a few things already here. Firstly, God's gracious intentions to live among His people despite their sin. See, God can't help being a consuming fire. He can't help being holy. That's just who He is. And so for Him to give His people a set of instructions so that they can live with Him, we've got to see the grace of God in that. Secondly, I want us to see here the good news that despite our sin, God was pleased to make a way. And thirdly, the danger His presence poses for those who don't come to Him according to His Word. That's what Nadab and Abihu are an example of. And Nadab and Abihu are a wonderful example of how important coming to God according to His Word is, because do you remember the, the, the slide that we had up there, when I, I, where we had a look at where the sacrifices were to be made? Nadab and Abihu weren't even in the tent when they were consumed by fire. They were out in the courtyard. And even as they ministered before God out in the courtyard... They came and and approached God in a way that wasn't in accordance with His Word, and God broke out in fire and killed them. And here is God now giving the high priest instructions about entering into that inner room behind the curtain where the presence of God dwelt. I can only imagine on this day, Aaron would have been sweating. And rightly so. Now, we're going to work through five things briefly in these instructions. Firstly, we're going to look at Aaron's clothes. We're going to look at the incense. We're going to look at the offerings, the sprinkling of blood, and the scapegoat. All right, Aaron's clothes, the incense, the offerings, the sprinkling of blood, and the scapegoat. So we can better understand this passage and hopefully better understand the work of our Lord Jesus on our behalf. So the first thing is to notice what Aaron was wearing. And so Leviticus 16 verse 4, let's read that one together. We're told he, this is Aaron and whatever high priest is going to follow him, he is to put on the sacred linen tunic with linen undergarments next to his body. He is to tie the linen sash around him and put on the linen turban. These are sacred garments. So he must bathe himself with water before he puts them on. And that's it. Now, if you remember back in the book of Exodus, you know, it took Moses 74 verses over two chapters to describe what the priests had to wear because it was in so much detail. But for the high priest, on the most sacred day of the year, for him to come into the most holy place, his clothing is described in one verse. 
one verse because he was wearing nothing but linen, white linen. The most humble clothes that you could find. Where the priest was normally the best dressed guy in town, he, he was glittering with gold and colored fabrics and precious stones. On the Day of Atonement, the high priest wore nothing but clean white linen. Because every other day, the priest represented God to the people. And so he had to be as glorious as you can make a mortal man because he's representing God. But on this day, he represented man to God. And so he wore nothing but a linen cloth. To symbolize that before God, he had nothing. No status, no authority, no bling, nothing to boast of, nothing to glory in. Before God, he was as plain as he could be. And that is how God wanted him to approach him. Which I think is a wonderful thing for us to consider. As we consider presenting ourselves before God, think about what I have to wear and how I have to look. Learn this lesson You don't have to dress up for God because He doesn't care about outward appearance. And this is what we learn here in part by looking at the simple clothes that the high priest was commanded to wear. That's the first thing to note. The second thing to note is what God commanded to be done with the incense. Read verses 12 and 13 with me so that we can better understand this. Now from verse 12, we're told, He, again the high priest, is to take a censer full of burning coals from the altar before the Lord and two handfuls of finely grounded fragrant incense, two handfuls, and take them behind the curtain. He is to put the incense on the fire before the Lord and the smoke of the incense will conceal the atonement cover, that's the Ark of the Covenant, above the tablets of the covenant law so that he will not die. So so at this point, he's offered the sacrifice out in the courtyard and it's been burned up and then he takes some burning coals from the sacrifice and he brings them into the most holy place. And then two handfuls of finely ground incense he puts on the burning coals to create a thick cloud of smoke that covers the Ark of the Covenant where God's presence was. And God says, do that so that you will not die. And this seems to symbolize what God said to Moses back in Exodus 33 when he said, No one can see my face and live. Because, like we've been saying throughout this series, God is holy and we are not. And even on this most sacred day, as the high priest came into the most holy place, there had to be a veil of smoke. To be the kind of veil between the high priest and God to save his life. That's the second thing to notice. The third thing to notice are the offerings. Now notice a general offering, which was the ram, an offering for himself, which was the bull, and then the two goats, which were an offering for the people. Now, we'll read about this from verse 3, and then we'll go 5 to 9. But let's start, chapter 16, verse 3. 
God says, this is how Aaron is to enter the most holy place. He must first bring a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. All right, so we've got the bull and the ram. Now let's go down to verse 5. We'll read 5 through to 9. From the Israelite community, he, the high priest, is to take two male goats for a sin offering and a ram for the burnt offering. Aaron is to offer the bull for his own sin offering to make atonement for himself and his household. Then he is to take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the entrance to the tent of meeting. He is to cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat. Aaron shall bring the goat whose lot falls to the Lord and sacrifice it for a sin offering. And we'll leave it there for a moment. Now notice, first of all, the ram was supposed to be sacrificed for a burnt offering. This is like a more general offering before God for the sake of sin. But the bull and the goats were a little bit more specific. The bull was offered as a sacrifice of atonement for himself as the high priest and for his household. And the two goats were to be used as a sacrifice of atonement for the sake of the people. Now, the offering of the bull was pretty straightforward. Right? The bull dies in place of the high priest and his household to atone for their sin. And after that, he took the two goats and he cast lots for them. Now, to cast lots, the modern way of thinking of casting lots is like to flip a coin. Or do you know the idea of drawing a short straw? That's the idea of casting lots. And God says to him, cast lots between the two goats, and whichever one draws the short straw, or whichever one the lot falls, that's the goat that needs to be offered to the Lord. The other one is used as a scapegoat. And we'll get to the scapegoat soon. But this is where the atonement for God's people was made. The blood of the bull and the blood of the lamb, uh, sorry, the goat whose the, the lot fell upon. It's, you see the blood shed and the, the penalty for sin was at atoned for. God's justice was satisfied because a death paid for sin, which is what the law required. And God's grace was given to the sinner because it was the blood of another that paid the price for their atonement. You see, even here, you've got justice and mercy being held together for the sake of God's people. To show the people that without the shedding of blood, there would be no forgiveness. Now, to have a look at a really important verse, go to Leviticus 17 and read verse 11. On the other side of the page, Leviticus 17, verse 11, is what God says to Moses. He says, For the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. This is what the blood sacrifices represented. Blood shed to atone for sin. From there, we come to the fourth thing to note, which is the sprinkling of blood. So we'll read verse 14 through to verse 16, back in Leviticus 16. 
So let's go back to Leviticus 16 and we'll read verse 14 through to the first half of verse 16. All right, so you would have noticed there, God says about the high priest in verse 14, he is to take some of the bull's blood and with his finger, sorry, I was going to say fingers, finger, use his finger, sprinkle it on the front of the atonement cover. Right, that's the Ark of the Covenant. Then he shall sprinkle some of it with his finger seven times before the atonement cover. He shall then slaughter the goat for the sin offering for the people and take its blood behind the curtain and do with it as he did with the bull's blood. He shall sprinkle it on the atonement cover and in front of it. In this way, he will make atonement for the most holy place because of the uncleanness and rebellion of the Israelites, whatever their sins have been. And we can leave it there. But notice the sprinkling of blood on the lid of the Ark of the Covenant where the Spirit of God dwelt. It was, it was not done in the sight of all the people. Do you notice the fact that no one would have seen him do that? Which begs the question, what's the point? And this command was given to the high priest to do after he had already created this cloud of incense, which would have acted as a veil between him and the ark in which he was sprinkling blood. So he was commanded to sprinkle the blood. No one, not that no one else saw it. He didn't, himself would have struggled to even see the blood that was being sprinkled out before God. But I think we understand the significance of this in light of that. I think the point is, the blood was shed because of sin to satisfy the justice of God and not man. The blood that makes atonement for sin was not done in the sight of the people because it wasn't to appease man. It was shed to appease God, whose justice had been offended. And so the blood of the offering was presented to God so that He could look upon it as an offering of atonement for the sin of His people in accordance with His Word. And to complete the process of atonement on this day, we come to the fifth and final thing to notice, who is the scapegoat? Remember the, go the, the high priest was commanded to take two goats? One goat he sacrificed for the sin of the people. The other goat we read about in verse 10. So Leviticus 16, verse 10, we'll read that together. God says, But the goat chosen by Lot as the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to be used for making atonement by sending it into the wilderness as a scapegoat. Now, further instructions, you'll see in verse 21 and 22. So, let's read that together. Leviticus 16, verse 21 and 22. We're told, again about the high priest, he is to lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins, and put them on the goat's head. He shall send the goat away into the wilderness in the care of someone appointed for the task. The goat will carry on itself all their sins to a remote place and the man shall release it in the wilderness. Now notice this innocent goat would carry the people's sins away from the presence of the Lord into the wilderness to fulfill the requirement of atonement. And although this goat seems to be the lucky one, anyone feel that he was like the lucky one? To be led out into the wilderness was not to be seen as a mercy 
It was led out there to die. It was a symbol of being cut off from the presence of the Lord. Thrown out from among the community of God's people. And cast away, never to be seen again because of, his, because of sin. And both hands of the high priest were to be pressed upon the goat's head to symbolize a transfer of guilt. You know, in the New Testament, sometimes we hear about the laying on of hands to kind of like anoint someone and to prepare them for ministry. It's kind of like you get a body of elders together and they lay their hands on someone to say, you have our authority to go and to do this or to do that. It's like a transfer of authority. Here, the laying on of hands is a transfer of guilt. Making the point that the goat was acting as a substitute for the people. What theologians have called a great exchange. As the sin of the people was transferred onto this innocent goat, and the goat was sent away, never to be seen again. Wouldn't it be good if dealing with sin was that easy? And this whole process was to be studied, taught, considered, obeyed, and trusted by every member of the community. And it was to be lived in light of. Teaching them that atonement can be made for sin, glory to God, but not by your good deeds, not by the quality of your life, not by your wisdom, not by your strength, but by the word of the living God through the sacrifice of an innocent substitute who will bear your sin to satisfy the justice of God so that you and He could be reconciled together. And this ritual was to be obeyed from one generation to the next until it was so engraved into the hearts and minds of this community that when the Saviour came to lay down His life to atone for the sin of many, they would recognize Him as the Savior of the world. So that as Jesus, the Messiah, came and spoke about His death as a ransom for many, they would see what God was doing through Him. And I hope that we all can see here how atonement the atonement of our Lord Jesus was predicted here in Leviticus, how it was revealed through the Gospels, how it was preached throughout the book of Acts, and how it was explained by the apostles in all the rest of the letters that make up the New Testament. Because it is the central theme of all the Scriptures and the central work of our Saviour who came to die upon the cross to save us from our sin. As the Apostle Paul said in what has to be the clearest passage in the New Testament about the work of Christ on our behalf, from Romans 3, he said, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of His blood, to be received by faith. This is what Leviticus 16 helps us to understand. Like the ram, the goats and the bull, Jesus was innocent and sinless. But the difference is, we're told in Scripture, that the blood of goats and bulls could never really take away sin anyway. They were only ever a shadow of what was to come when God appeared as a man 
to make atonement for the sin of his people. Can you imagine how many goats and bulls and rams were sacrificed in the 1,500 years that Israel stood as a nation waiting for the Messiah to come? All that blood, all that death, simply so that we would recognize what God was doing in Jesus. And Jesus not only fulfills the sacrifices, but He also fulfills the priesthood. Notice the high priest, he stood before God on behalf of the people. The high priest who came into the presence of God with a bloody sacrifice that God accepted. The high priest who came in humility wearing nothing but a linen robe dipped in blood standing between a holy God and a sinful people as a mediator between the two. It all points to our high priest Jesus, who didn't simply go behind the curtain, but who offered himself as a sacrifice of atonement that split the curtain of the temple in two from top to bottom, symbolizing God's perfect justice so perfectly satisfied and our sins so completely atoned for that we now have access to the most holy place through faith in Him. And like the scapegoat, Jesus removes our sins so far from the presence of God and so far from the community of those who trust in Him that it may as well be lost in the wilderness, never to be found again. To remind us that although God is holy and we are sinful, glory to God, He's made a way. To remind us that although we are helpless, God is able. And to remind us that before it's about us or our gifts or what we have to offer, it's about God presenting Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of His blood to be received by faith. Church, this is the gospel. So that no one can boast. So that we would live to the glory of God alone and that our lives would reflect the grace of God in which we now stand. Church, this grace kills pride and motivates divine love for God and for those He came to save because we know what we deserve. But for the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus who laid down His life so that we could be set free. And church, at some point this week, I want you to go to the New Testament book of Hebrews, because in Hebrews chapter 9 and 10, he explains how Jesus fulfills the day of atonement. Hebrews 9 and 10. And right at the end of that section, we have three points of application that are given to us by the Apostle and divinely inspired by God's Spirit. Right, in light of all that Jesus has done for us, fulfilling the Day of Atonement, you know what God says at the three points of application? That is how His people should respond to all that He has fulfilled on our behalf. These are the three points of application according to Scripture. One, let us draw near to God with sincerity and full assurance of faith. If God has done this, let that speak to your conscience. Secondly, 
let us hold tight to the hope that we have and not let go of it. And thirdly, let us consider how we can spur each other on toward love and good deeds. He says, not giving up meeting with one another, as some are in the habit of doing, but all the more as we see the day approaching. That's how God said the Day of Atonement should shape the lives of His people. That day being the second coming of our Lord to bring salvation to those who are waiting for Him and living in light of the hope that we have because of all that He has done for us. Amen? Let's pray that we'll put this into practice. Our Father in heaven, as we continue to learn about you, your holiness, your separateness, your glory, your perfections, your hatred for sin, your love for all that is good and beautiful, your desire to bring life, your hatred for death. God, and as we continue to see ourselves and our needs, weak and frail and sinful and stained, God, we are so thankful that you have looked upon us with compassion and you have provided a way for atonement to be made for our sins so we can be reconciled together. Father, there cannot be a clearer indication of your will for us to be saved than for you to make a way for us to be forgiven. Lord, for us to see that from the beginning, your plan was to send your Son to die in our place. Lord, we, we understand why you killed Nadab and Abihu. Lord, we understand why all of this had to be done in so much detail, because in your mind, it was all pointing us to the day your son would sacrifice himself upon the cross. And now that we live in light of it, God, I pray that this knowledge would not make us proud or half-hearted, Lord, but that it would make us humble servants who are willing to lay down our lives in service to you because of all that you have done for us in love. God, we thank you so much that you have made a way. We pray that in the same way that you require the Israelites to look and study and learn and obey, that we would do the same as we look to the cross of Christ. That we would not be caught up being too busy with all the other mundane things in life, all the other things that are important but not the most important thing. I pray that everything that we do in life would flow out from our devotion to Jesus because of who He is and what He has done for us. God, we can only do this by the power of Your Spirit, for apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. So please fill us with Your Spirit and enable us to live lives that are worthy of the calling that we have received.